Okay. So what I want to do is quick, I do a quick recap of where we left off last time with uh, mediation stuff. Okay. So we went through our mediation, talked about conceptually what's going on with, with these models, how we kind of go through and, and set things up. And we finished up with uh, an example. Towards the end of class, uh, ended up with, a, with an example looking at um, attitudes to support utilization. This is my willingness to engage people in my support network, the extent to which I think people are in trust. Or PSD and re reductions in social. Uh, mediation three. set this up in our basic causal steps model. There we go. Oh, you will be. I fixed this in my slide deck and then didn't change it. Oh. Uh, that's all right. Yes, I am recording. Thank you. Yes, no, thank you. I got that. Always good to check to make sure if I'm recording things. Okay. Um, so we flip this around. God damn it. Um, so in step one, uh, we're looking at our C uh, path, which is actually this one. Okay, we're looking at PTSD symptoms on support, right? And so we see here that we have evidence that yes, PTSD is related to support. And so this is our C path, not our A path. This is our C path. And this should be step one. Step two, we're looking at our A path, getting the relation between our intervening variable and our outcome. Looking at support utilization as our outcome, PTSD as our input to get this path. And the final step down here, we're regressing our outcome onto both our mediator and our predictor uh, to get our B path. This is going to be the relation of our mediator uh, with our outcome controlling for our base predictor. And this is going to be our C prime and our B. Okay. And remember that we're looking, depending on how we want to think about this stuff, is traditionally we thought about looking at mediation as the reduction prime. To what extent do we see a reduction in that C path once we account for that mediating variable, right? But a more way I would encourage you to think about this is looking at this as a function of this direct effect the effect of X on Y through your mediator. So what is this AB path here, okay? And we talked to things. Um, uh, equivalent to one another. It doesn't matter which way you go through and calculate it, right? So someone tell me what is Yeah, the, the coefficient for my C path. Um, uh, nope, the actual the actual number, like with the calculator. What's negative 0 0.03 minus 0 0.009? Give that 0.0009. 
right? Zero, nine, and what? But we can also calculate this as the indirect path of A, B, Y, more. We know three. Uh, nope, that the problem because I got this turner. I have one. Yeah. And B path. And what that number is. One okay. it doesn't turn out quite exactly right, but we probably got some rounding stuff in there. Is that right? If we take oh, my mistake, so they're mathematically equivalent, right. They are the same thing, which I can tell you they're mathematically equivalent, but sometimes it's like nice actually, like sort of what happens if we actually calculate these coefficients, they're the, the exact same thing, right? Yeah. What's up? Yeah, so they're, they're sort of coming from your actual regression models that you've, that you've run, right? Regression of y onto x. A is the regression of your mediator x. Uh, B is the regression of y onto b on your and your predictor, right? So this is all just coming from from your from your coefficient table here, right? So we can think about this this uh, mediated effect as the reduction from c to c prime, or we can think about it as the indirect effect. Now the reduction in c to c prime is fine and works out slick if we're in a simple mediation model. But as soon as we start getting more complex path models, now all of a sudden that starts to get more difficult, right? And so this is why that indirect effect approach and thinking about that starts to become kind of a more flexible way to be thinking. Do we need to have, right? So we say, okay, we agree that 0.021 is our estimate of our indirect effect, right? What we need to do now though is we want to test this. Is that some value that's different? Do I have evidence that this is some non-zero value, right? Well, it looks pretty small, looks pretty close to zero to me, right? But I, that's all sort of based on uh, scaling and things like that. So what we have done historically is derive formula, right? And here, again, uh, your standard error is a function of your coefficients for your A and your B path and the corresponding uh, uh, standard errors. We go through, we run this out, and we see that we standard error of 0 0.003. We then use that, plug that into a Z formula estimate by our standard error. And then it goes through and it gives us a Z score that we can then test against a P, all that kind of stuff. And so then we can test evidence. For, uh, a non-zero indirect effect of X on Y through what's that? One one more time. What? Yeah, M plus might, but you would never ask for this in M plus because you've got better ways to do it. What's that now? Yeah, yeah. Yes, it will. If you if you're if you're taking that approach. Now the problem is is that this is historically people have not had access or sort of understood SEM and having opportunities to do that. If you do and can take that approach, it's really nice because you can use different estimators that account for violations of normality and things along these lines, right? And can go through and start to put in different models. But historically, for folks. Uh, limited to OLS uh, types of things. 
this was a really big sort of situation. And even in M plus, the derivation of some of these indirect, there's still stuff that all of a sudden, if you start having dichotomous mediators and outcomes, as like me sending emails to the mutants and saying like, hey, and they're like, oh, I don't know, this is kind of close enough, maybe. They're still not, like, there are limitations. We can't just do whatever, right? There are still limitations there. But historically, this is how in sort of a standard uh, OLS, been done, yeah. relationship anything that's left over should be sort of nothing right just because it goes away now we talked about there are a lot of problems with that sort of uh, partial mediations and things along those remember and this is like Kenny like maybe that c doesn't go completely c prime isn't completely zero right but it's has it reduced right and this is what the Sobel test you can think about the Sobel test is testing whether or not a it's for a reduction in C to C prime or F zero B. They're mathematically equivalent. It's just thinking about things as testing that indirect effect tends to be more flexible. Okay. So we then went through and talked about limitations. Okay, people understand sort of our sort of causal steps and how we're getting this stuff comfortable there. Really easy, just a series of three regression models for your uh, uh, situation here. Pretty straightforward, right? Hardest thing is then making sure that you've got all the right numbers in your Sobel standard error, but as long as you got those numbers correct, you're good to go, okay? So we had finished last time talking about limitations of this steps approach, okay? And we talked about People have said, do I need to have an association between X and Y to start with? Do I have to have evidence for? There are lots of reasons why we might not act just a basic line association between X and Y. If things are measured far away in time, there's stuff that can come in. I can run into power issues, right? I can run into effects where the combination of X and Y, or excuse me, my indirect my AB path might be very close in magnitude to my residual path, mathematically canceling things out, right? Uh, so we can have some stuff going on here. And so in general, thinking about, do I need to have evidence for a, uh, an effect and an association of X on Y before I jump into a mediation model? It will make your life considerably easier if you do, okay? But there are ways to, so there are situations where you might make an argument that this is why we're not identifying an association between X and Y from the beginning, right? It could be, we measured these things far apart in time. We've got pretty subtle effects, maybe a power issue. Uh, maybe we say, this is something that's well-established in the literature. And so like, I'm gonna assume that yes, there is an effect here to be, uh, identified, uh, we could have some suppressor stuff in terms of opposite sign. So there are reasons, but in general, particularly if you're using cross-sectional data, really will make your life easier if you just have that base relationship to talk about first, yes. It's nice to have that as a basis, right? Like it would be hard if I'll pick on Allie. If Allie just says, "Hey, I want to know Z mediates the relation between X and Y," but no one's ever looked at X and Y to see if X and Y are related, and there's really no reason that M should be associated. Like it's hard to come up with a reason why M would be a causal process in X and Y. I mean, maybe, right? I'm, there's a million different psych journals. You could probably publish it somewhere. But 
this again starts to become a, particularly in the types of data that we're using, starts to become very sort of theory conceptually driven approach to this. You want to have a very, very good reason that, yeah, X should be an agent of Y, right? Like as in it should probably, this is kind of the thing that then in general we think drives this thing. M is, and we've established that these two things are related. So our next question is, boy, why, like what might account for this association? Well, we've got M and we know that M is kind of in between like sort of X probably does drive M and then M could drive X or Y. And so what we're gonna do is, and so it wouldn't make sense if we were to flip this all around because if I can re if I can just shuffle this model and it still makes pretty good sense, I've got a pretty poor model and it's gonna be hard for me to advocate for it, right? But if all those things are put together and I can this model, then I can kind of move forward. But if no one's looked at any of it before and there's no theory to say, hey, this is how this stuff should work out. Yeah, it's an up, it's an upward hill. So not saying you couldn't do it or shouldn't try. I'm just saying you're in a weaker position from a conceptual standpoint than if you have conceptual basis for your arguments, okay? Questions? Okay. So this, these are some of the conceptual things with, should I have a relation between X and Y? Okay. Uh, historically, we said, absolutely. Hayes makes very solid arguments that says, well, not necessarily. That doesn't mean it's a free for all, but you probably should have some sort of basis for making an argument based relation to start with, okay? Mathematically, statistically, methodologically, the bigger issue is, is how do we go through and calculate that standard error? Remember that anytime we go through a statistical test, we need to have some sort of estimate. We have to have some sort of understanding about what am I testing and what is the distribution of this thing in the population, okay? Um, and the problem is, is that classic Sobel approach to testing uh, these indirect effects, it's an approximate standard error. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a, uh, it's not an exact standard error. Okay. And so technically that standard error estimate that we have isn't the proper estimate that we should have for that indirect effect. Okay. We look at the sampling distribution of AB, right? And again, remember, someone tell me what a sampling distribution is. Perfect. So if I wanted to look at sampling dish baby for samples of size, do is I would run this model of all possible samples with replication of size 100 that could be pulled from a population. And then for every single one of those samples, I would calculate AB, and then I would plot AB in terms of the distribution of AB, and that would give me my sampling distribution of AB, right? And the reason statistics works, at least a frequency, a frequency, I take, if, a, if the thesis, if mean one minus mean two, equals zero. I know that if I randomly sample from population one, population two, take the different score, is gonna have this distribution. If I've not violated any assumptions, if I've conducted this in a vacuum, I know exactly what the sampling distribution of that test statistic is gonna be. And so then cut points, if I find anything outside of that, I'm gonna take that as evidence against the null hypothesis, right? But it's all predicated on knowing what that sampling distribution looks like. So when we're running T tests, when we're running F tests, when we're running chi squares, this is all predicated, all of our inferences predicated on knowing what the distribution of that test statistic should look like, okay? Problem is with sampling distribution, we don't know what it looks like exactly, right? Because it's gonna differ depending on all the different. But what the real, right? If my indirect effect is uh, positive, then I have a positive uh, distribution. If I have a negative indirect effect, it's going to have a negative distribution, 
Okay. Problem is, is that my Sobel standard error, this is a normal distribution, normal, this is a normal distribution standard error, right? that we're working like this, okay? So what Sobel is doing is it's making assumptions saying, okay, if we assume the distribution looks like this, this gives us a good approximation. Problem is we know that the distribution doesn't look like that, it looks like something like this, right? And so what we get is an inappropriate estimate of our standard error, and if our standard error estimate is inappropriate, what does that do to our test statistic? Makes our test statistic inappropriate, right? It's not precise. And so Bell is good-ish. It kind of is a ballpark thing. But if we're wanting precision, Sobel is not the way to go. Okay. And so what we see is that our tests based on Sobel are going to be underpowered uh, and resulting in inflated type. It means that they're not super sensitive and we're going to reject the null or we're going to fail to reject the null more often than we should. Okay. Um, so unless you have very large sample sizes, or you have very large effect sizes, you can assume that your Sobel test is going to be underpowered. Okay. We often have large samples in psychological research. We often have large effect sizes in psychological research. So most of the time, we're assuming that this Sobel approach is going to be underpowered. Okay. And it's going to lead us to fail to identify effects when those effects are actually there uh, more often than we would expect, okay? And there have been some variations on Sabelle, try and help to kind of shore this up, but the approach remains limited. Okay. Questions on why Sabelle is problematic from a mathematical standpoint. Basically, the effect or the, the, the coefficient that we're wanting to test doesn't have the distribution that's being assume, assumed uh, with our with the derivation of the standard error, we can put it on and it gets kind of close, but it's not perfect, right? And it's not precise, which impacts our inferences. Okay. Um, so we've had some adjustments doing some confidence interval stuff, but again, the confidence interval is based on the standard error. So if the standard error is whack, then we still don't have ooh, the, that problem. Then extends to your confidence bounds. Okay. So. People, we just dealt with this for a while because we didn't have a easily accessible, a uh, better solution. But with the inclusion of increased computing power, we now do and have access to a better approach. Okay, and this better approach uh, involves some bootstrapping procedures. Bootstrapping is we're generating what we would call an empirical distribution of an estimated parameter. Okay, if I'm thinking about a t-test, the distribution of a t-test, or let's say a z, a z score. Emily, do I need to, do I have any problems knowing what the distribution of a z score should be from a mathematical standpoint? Nope. I know what z scores look like. I know what t scores look like. I know what chi-square distributions. I know what f's look like. I have a theoretical distribution that if I don't violate my assumptions, this is the lawful distribution of this, uh, of this outcome. But sometimes we have statistics, things we're interested in, there is no impair, or there is no theoretical distribution, or it's complex and we can't easily derive it. What we do with a bootstrapping procedure is what we do, and we create a distribution based on our sample data. And this is the best practice approach for going through and testing mediation, at least within uh, an OLS framework. Okay, so for this bootstrap procedure, what I do is I use my data that I have as my population. And what I do is I bootstrap samples of n cases with replacement from my sample. So let's say I have a sample of 100 individuals. Okay, I have 100 observations in my uh, 100 observations in my sample. What I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a bootstrap sample of 100 people. Okay, now if I draw a bootstrap sample of 100 people, how do I not just end up with the same data from my sample? What's different about the bootstrap sample? Matt, do you know? Yeah. Yeah. So every time I do this, I could go through and have a bootstrap 
sample. In my bootstrap, bootstrap sample, Josiah could be in that sample five times, zero times, or 50 times. I don't know, right? Because every time I pull Josiah out, Josiah gets kicked back in. And so what I then do is I go through and I run this bootstrap sample. Usually it's the same size as the actual sort of number of observations you have with replication. I go through and I estimate that sample of that AB effect within the bootstrap sample I've pulled. And then I do that over and over and over and over and over again, about 5,000 times, let's say, yeah. Mm -hmm. So if I talk about bootstrap samples, I've got my sample of 100 people. And so what I do is I randomly if I'm randomly sampling with replacement, that I get the exact same set of unique uh, observations as I have in my actual sample. Probably be randomly drawing a unique set of 100 individuals out of 100 people is on. Say if I'm bootstrapping, if you're my sample, right? You, so there's seven of you, right? And so I randomly sample seven people, right? So I go through and I get Emily twice, Sam once, Vasha twice, uh, Josiah and Matt. And that bootstrap sample, Katie, you're not in it, right? But then I go through and I do it again, and I do it again, and I do it again. And what I end up doing is for each one of those samples that I pull, those empirical, those, that boot, for each one of those bootstrap samples, then I go through and I run my mediation model with that. And then I do it again, and I do it again, and I do it again, thousands of times, right? Sort of, uh, sort of default in the, in the uh, procedure we'll use about 5,000. So basically I do this 5,000 times, okay? So each time I rerun this mediation model, it's gonna be a little bit different. My AB uh, effect is just gonna be a little bit different. And what I then do is and plot those coefficients out across those 5,000 bootstrap samples. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get a distribution of scores, okay? And this scores look, right? But what I then do is I'll go through, once I have my empirical distribution, the standard deviation of this, right? Because remember, that's what standard error is. Standard error is just the sampling, uh, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, right? And then what I can do, because I have an estimate uh, of a standard error, what I can then do is, that and so right yeah my sampling distribution says that uh sort of my 95 percent confidence bound for uh this indirect effect does not contain zero therefore i have evidence for an indirect effect yeah nope yep yep exactly yes It's, it's all the, the program does it for you. Oh. Yeah, you can determine, you can set the number of, of replications that you wanna run, but you hit a point of diminishing, diminishing return and increased computing power. I mean, you can set that for 100,000. It's just gonna make your computer sit there for a longer amount of time. It's not gonna actually increase that much precision. You kind of get diminishing returns on that. but is a major technique using a lot of different areas. I need, you know, a hundred thousand bootstrap replications for like simulation research or something like that. Bootstrap 
uh, procedure. Is this an easy, would this be an easy thing to do by hand? No, it would be incredibly burdensome. And in the absence of, unless you were, had access to computing power and knew how to program things, right? In the 80s and 90s, this was probably not an option for you, right? But we've made technological advances now. And so at this point, um, process has become very popular um, because it's an excellent tool um, and does a lot of really slick stuff. This is a program that people will use or, or macro that people will use to go through and, and do this. Um, there's different sort of variations of this uh, bootstrap confidence interval uh, thing in terms of how they're defining the cut points for stuff. Um, procedure okay so uh in general what you should find is if you've got a very clear indirect effect the difference between old school old school sobel and um bootstrapping procedures should be pretty subtle you should probably land in the same spot generally um if you've got very clear evidence for an indirect effect but remember the well approach was that really it's underpowered. So if you're kind of there and sort of trying to have a, if you're underpowered already or have a subtle effect or something like that, what you might do is miss something that actually is there. And the bootstrapping procedure is kind of the better way to go about this. Okay. Questions on bootstrapping and what's happening with this. With what? I, well, it'll bootstrap whatever you give it. So now, if you're missing values in there, I don't know that. I don't know that you can give it. Um, I don't know. I don't use process a lot. I don't think that it will impute values for you if you've got missing values in it, and you're comfortable using. values on your exogenous variable because then they're just gone gone so um so i don't believe process will impute stuff then you're getting a whole missing data issue with that yeah that's a good question is should we be using bootstrapping for other things field that you're in so my brother is a wildlife biologist and they do all sorts of bootstrapping stuff all the time. Bootstrapping is like they're, uh, they bootstrap the hell out of everything, right? Um, there are pros and cons. It's not a sort of a, a fix all, but again, it's one of those kind of domain specific things. So bootstrapping can be used for sort of lots of things generally in psychology as we often have our critters are often undergrads and are easily captivated and forced into uh, research and things along those lines, right? Um, so yeah, bootstrapping is used for other types of things. We won't cover it here, but yeah, it is a statistical approach that's used in, in other areas. What's that? Yeah, well, the problem is, is your bootstrapping as your sample that you've got, right? So if I got a biased sample and I just replicate sort of my biased sample, what do I end up with? A biased sample, right? And so sometimes people will say, oh, I don't have that many folks in my sample. So what I'm just going to do is I'm just going to run bootstraps and that's going to fix it. It's not. It's garbage in, garbage out, right? Um, there are things that we can use this for, but it's not something that... Uh, is a is a magic bullet approach yeah uh, who's used process familiar with process Brittany, do you like using process <laughs> 
Okay. Okay. So what process is, is it's just a program that's written not by the SPSS folks, uh, but uh, Andrew Hayes, um, who just kind of does this thing. Basically what you've got, and I've got this in your folder that you can go through and take a look now. Process used to be uh, a program that was just, you go to the website and download it, and you still can. The problem is, is that like all the sort of information that you need to run it, at least in terms of anything that's complex is now contained in Hayes' textbook. So you have to get Hayes' textbook to really sort of understand what's going on. But the idea is that uh, what Hayes has done is it's put together, he and his lab has put together different models, right? And so here's model one, this is a moderation model. Model two, here's two moderators. Model three, here is a three-way interaction where you've got a moderated, moderated model. Model four, this is simple mediation, right? And if you go down through all sorts of models, so I'm getting there, calm down. Ninety-two isn't even a real thing on, so this is an old one. This is, uh, yeah, so. The idea is, is what you can do is conceptually say, hey, this is the model that I want to run. And what the macro will do is it will run it for you, which is a nice thing to have so long as you know what it's doing and how to interpret it. Because if you don't, then you're just getting a bunch of numbers that you're not going to know up from down, right? Um, and so the it's slick, but the drawback is, is okay, like what, is that really the model that you want? Do you have a reasonable reason to expect that this is how this model is gonna turn out? There's, there's some ways to do it, but the nice thing and the advantage of this is it goes through and it opens up the opportunity for look at some comp, more comp, complex uh, conditional indirect effect models for people who don't have or are not familiar with SEM types of programs, okay? It's kind of a, it, what it is, is a canned package program that will go through and provide you with a great amount of information, which is fantastic so long as you know what you're doing and why you're doing it and why you're asking for it. Yeah. Yes, it does, yeah. So what we're doing, here for our simple mediation in process is just model four, okay? And so what you're gonna do here is once you run the macro in uh, SPSS or SAS or whatever you use, Erica, do you use SAS in Ben's or do you use SPSS? What do you, or you just go straight up R? Okay, yeah, all right. So if, you're, if that's the sort of area you're working with, you probably are sort of fine with this, but folks who are sort of more grounded in sort of SPSS, OLS-based models, what you do is you go through and you run the macro and statement here, do what you want, uh, the model that you want to run. Uh, here is the command for running a simple mediation model. Uh, what we have here is Y is going to be uh, where you put in your outcome variable, X is your independent variable. This can be continuous or dichotomous, okay? Um, you can have uh, M is going to be whatever your intervening variable is, and then your model statement is telling it which model to go through and pull from. Yep. It's a program that you go through. I'll show you. You just go through and you run it, and it kind of loads a set of commands into SPSS that then it will go through and run. Like, so if you just run this in SPSS, SPSS is gonna give you an error message. But if you run the macro first and then put that in, that macro loads in sort of the language and, the, and so all the stuff within the package, and then you can go through and run this, okay? Now there are ways to go through and sort of permanently install process in SPSS. If you were doing this a lot and you wanted to, I'm not gonna have you worry about that because that's more than I need you to work on uh, for this thing. So 
you've got additional options so we can ask for we can uh, change around the bootstrap for the the default for the bootstrap we can change around confidence intervals um we can look at total effects this is if we have a multiple mediated model you can look at total direct indirect effects and total uh, direct effects normal equals one this is going to give you your Sabell test for your indirect effects the old school stuff that we were doing over here it'll calculate that for you and drop it in there just if you want to compare um, looking at effect sizes you can look at different contrasts you can say hey i want you to go through and mean center all my stuff for me it'll go through and do that right so lots of different options that you can go through and do this is what it looks like okay so if i go through and i run this we see uh, a model for my uh, outcome is support my x is ptsd my mediator is utilization okay giving me is my uh my first uh path a well here interesting that what we've got is my outcome is utilization right which is my uh predictor is ptsd this is giving me my coefficient my standard error my t -test. here's my statistics right if i go through and i take a look at sort of the path that i ran in spss it's identical, right? If I regress my mediator onto my outcome for path A, it's the exact same thing, okay? Here, second part of my outcome, my outcome is support. Here's my PTSD, my utilization, my B and C path, right? And if I look at my uh, third step here where I, uh, where I regress perceived support onto PTSD and, and support utilization, everything matches up here, okay? Uh, here, I've got support as my outcome, PTSD is just my, my, my path C. Again, everything lines up, okay? The reason I'm telling you this is that, I, so that you know, process doesn't do anything magical. It's just, it's just automating the things that you were doing by hand already. So this first piece, you will never get a different A path, B path, C and C prime out of process than you would just running the regressions on your own. Bootstrapping has not yet come into play. It is identical to exactly what you would get sort of this, and you can see all these match up perfectly, okay? What you do get from process is after it goes through and runs that, is you're gonna to get this uh, sort of piece that says total direct and indirect effects of X on Y. What we're seeing here is a total effect of X on Y in a simple mediation model. That's just my C path, right? Because that's all the relation there is to have. Then we get a direct effect of X on Y. This is my C path or my C path. So if we go from C to C prime, this reduction, right? The coefficients all match up to exactly what we were doing before, okay? Then what we get is our indirect, indirect effect of X on Y through utilization, okay? This is my bootstrapped, okay? And so what it's saying, oh, here's my indirect effect. Cool, we knew that. We calculated that by hand. Here's my bootstrap standard error, and here's my boots, my percentile bootstrapped confidence bound. So my percentile, uh, based on the data that I've collected, for this indirect effect is negative 0.028. Upper bound is negative 0.015. Based on this, what do I conclude? Do I have evidence for an indirect effect in these data? What do you think? Does that? Why not? Here's the comp. Not for C prime, for A B. This is my for my indirect effect. We do, yeah. How do we know that? Because it doesn't contain zero, right? So my indirect effect, my bootstrapped indirect effect, uh, has a my point estimate is 0 0.021, lower bound is 0 0.028. Uh, negative 0.028, upper bound is negative 0.015. Based on this, I have evidence for an indirect effect of X on Y through M, okay? Now here's my normal theory test that I asked for. And so here again is my effect. That's gonna be the same. My standard error is gonna be a little bit different, uh, right? And if you notice my standard error, not only a little bit, but it's bigger than what I would expect here, which makes sense because my concern is that uh, my Sabell test is underpowered, right? Here's my Z statistic, here's my P, so 
I mean, that's here, we have pretty strong evidence for this indirect effect. So these two things aren't telling us anything terribly different, right? It's just the bootstrapped effect is gonna be the better approach for some of those things that maybe have low power, lower sample, smaller effects, things along these lines, okay? And so here, we give you 95% confidence intervals, uh, boot straps with this, and that's the end of it, okay? So, looks like in the SPSS, if I go through and pull up this data set, okay? And this is all uh, there for you in um, on Y of courses. If you pull up the process syntax file, okay. Emily, this is what this looks like. This is all sorts of stuff, okay. The nice thing is with this, you do not have to and should absolutely not touch anything with that, change anything with that, do anything with that. You just hit control A or weird Apple, whatever you got if you're one of those folks. And then you just go through and just run this whole program, okay? And what this does is it loads the macro up into SPSS, okay? And then what I've got here, is just my model statement, right? This is just my model, right? I've got my outcome is support, my X is PTSD, my mediator is utilization. Um, I'm wanting model four, total equals one because I'm just asking it to give me total effects and normal equals one because I want it to give me my Sobel stuff. If I go through and hit that, That's it, right? And so what this does is it gives you a tool to go through and run these bootstrap confidence bounds in a way that doesn't require you to program anything, that doesn't uh, require you to go through and hand resample 5,000 times with replacement from your thing. This is a powerful and very, very, very cool uh, set of commands. And again, if you go through and take a look at, as you get into more complicated stuff, right? into models that we're talking about, um, you know, uh, different indirect effects. How many indirect effects do we have here, right? Indirect effects of X on Y, we have X uh, on Y through M2, X on Y through M1, and then X on Y through both M1 and M2, right? Um, here, even more indirect effects, right? That's starting to get a little bit ridiculous. Here we've got a conditional indirect effect, right? Where our indirect effect of X on Y through uh, M is moderated by W, right? This allows you to go through. So now only, not only do I have an indirect effect to contend with, but now a moderator of that indirect effect. So there's all sorts of very, very cool things that you can go through and do with this program. You just wanna make sure that you, one, understand what it's doing, have a good reason for doing, what you're asking it to do, and then making sure that you understand how to interpret the output from that, okay? And that's involved more reading than just knowing that this is sort of a, 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 a tool is very helpful. The, the, the big, that just loads up the entire program into SPSS. Now, when you close out of SPSS, it'll be gone, and then you reopen it up and you have to rerun the macro. Now, if you're a heavy process user, there are instructions for going through and getting that kind of plugged in to the program. So every time you open it up, it comes through, and then there's some other stuff you can do if you want to get fancy with SPSS and sort of do some like pull down stuff that's probably more hassle than it's worth, right? But if you wanted to, there are ways to go through and do that. So 
yes, for running this, and I'm, all I'm going to have you do in the problem set is just run the simple mediation model, okay? But for that, you just need to open up the process uh, macro file that I sent you, hit highlight all, and just run it. And then it's just a simple line of code. I mean, you can continue to run sort of whatever you want to in, in SPSS. SPSS works fine. It will just recognize those process commands and go through and run those, okay? So it's easy, easy. Arguably too easy sometimes is sort of people get uh, over their skis and will sometimes start running things that they don't really understand what's going on. Um, I had a reviewer one time got a paper back. It was a moderation analysis and they were mad that I didn't run it in process, um, which is ridiculous because process is, it's the same goddamn model. It's like, there's nothing different with, with it. So, Knowing what it does and what it doesn't do is important. Sort of recognizing here, all of this is identical to what you get in OLS. The only thing that you get that's interesting from this whole model is this line right here. This is, and not even, it's just this, excuse me, it's this bootstrap, it's these three numbers. Out of the whole thing, those three numbers are the only thing that is unique to this process model but these are very nice to have, okay? So. so moderation mediation, we talked about both models. Extensions here, uh, what we can do is we can start to look at moderation with higher order terms. We can start looking at three-way interactions. That's probably about as high as you wanna go unless you have a very, very, very good reason to expect a four-way interaction, but you know. You can also start to model quadratic cubic functions and things like that if you expect nonlinearity within your model. So lots of cool things we can do there. We can do mediation with covariates, okay? What we could do is we could look at the indirect effect of X on Y through some mediator controlling for other things, right? So uh, we've got uh, looking at whether or not, um, the relationship time variable and fruit and vegetable intake, I'm assuming this is probably in kids, is mediated through preferences. But here, some other, this is actually kind of complicated. There's some other stuff going on, but we can go through and start to look at uh, other covariates controlling for things. We can have multiple mediators, right? This starts to get at this idea that in psychology, is there any, any process or is there any uh, association that's probably caused by one single factor? Probably not, right? I would be hard pressed to think about a single actual psychological behavioral process that is all accounted for by one mechanism, right? And this starts to get into uh, problems with model misspecification, right? If I don't have all the uh, relevant factors in there, I have a misspecified model and it's gonna bias my estimates, right? So here, what we can do is we can start to look at the effect of X on Y through multiple different paths. Okay. And then we get into what traditionally has been called moderated mediation and mediated moderation. This is a combination of these two processes, right? Now, mathematically, moderated mediation and mediated moderation are identical, right? And so there's been a lot of literature to the late 90s, early 2000s about like kind of what this is and how they're different. Um, so I have a paper where I sort of jumped in and try to sort, sort through a lot of this stuff. Hayes has done a fantastic job of clarifying kind of the language around this and sort of talking about this as, I mean, you can talk about them as different things and some are more useful than others, but at the end of the day, what we're talking about is conditional indirect effects. We have some indirect effect that goes through and is dependent on something else, right? And so this moderated mediation, mediated moderation, but a distinction and fight has kind of gone away under the larger umbrella, just calling it uh, conditional indirect effects, which is uh, a nice way to go through and think about things in another contribution of Hayes's work. But here we can start looking at, is the indirect effect of X on Y through M, does that change, right? Are there some factors that change the strength of this as a mechanistic uh, factor within this association? How does that change? What does that look like? So some really cool things that we can do. And so this is why for you all, placing such a heavy focus on the mechanics and sort of understanding the basics of regression, because once you've got a handle on that,
sky's the limit, go nuts. Sort of going through, teach yourself this stuff. Um, lots of different ways with this generalized linear model we can go through and start putting things together. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. 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 And again, like I would have to go to something that I use a whole lot um, just because I'll tend to default into SEM frameworks and things along those lines. And it gives you a little bit more flexibility on how you go through and put things together. But yes, I believe with model four, if you just say utilization sort of in sort of this and that are my other two things that'll just run it. And then what it will give you is the total indirect effects and total direct effects and sort of all that type of stuff. So again, go through, definitely look through uh, Hayes's text to go through and see. Now, the other thing through, too, you need to be careful about, like I said, if you have what your level of measurement are, like you can, if you start having dichotomous outcomes, like process will no longer handle dichotomous outcomes. It did before, but I don't think those estimates were correct. And so Hayes cut them out of the, the new process. So it won't, if you've got a dichotomous outcome, it won't do that. I think you can have a dichotomous mediator and can handle that. If you start to have both, then that gets tricky. So be aware that the level of measurement starts to have an impact in terms of how you're thinking about this stuff. But with sufficient research, you can almost always figure it out unless you have a dichotomous mediator and dichotomous outcome. And then there appears to be no solution to that yet, but we'll get there eventually. Okay. So last slide here, reporting uh, our regression analysis in terms of thinking about for papers, publications, uh, things along those lines, always deviations. Sometimes it's hard to figure out how to sneak them in there, but please always report means and standard deviations. It's terrible to need those from a paper and not have them be, been reported. Also, uh, should to the greatest extent that you can, you uh, may a metric bivariate association. This is super helpful because if I need to know whether X, look at the extent to which X or Y are related in the previous literature, I don't care, Emily, if X and Y were primary variables in your model or if you even care about that. But if you reported correlation table, and I can pull your study and say, well, there it is, right? It's at least information for me. We can often include uh, means and standard deviations in that correlation table. You got the matrix, means and standard deviations at the bottom, really slick, efficient package to go through and do that. Uh, reporting your model R squared. Um, this is giving you sort of index of the overall model, right? That's a nice thing to put in. It's generally not what we're most interested in in uh, psychological science, but it's a nice thing. If you want to put in adjusted R squared, that's fine. It's probably not a, no one's going to get in our field, probably get too worked up about that, um, but want to report some uh, piece of that in there. Reporting your standardized coefficients. This is nice because it gives me a metric for across your predictors, looking at relative strength. Uh, your unstandardized uh, coefficients. Um, these are nice for expected change in, in Y given a unit change in X. Uh, that's helpful. Confidence bounds for your indirect or for your unstandardized coefficients. These are also very helpful to have. Again, this is often stuff that you can just drop into tables. And so if someone wants to know upper and lower bounds, it's there, and then some estimate of effect size. Um, where semi-partials are nice for an intuitive piece of things. Sometimes those are super, super small. And like I am saying, I'm accounting for, you know, uh, a half of a percentage of the variability in the outcome. That's sort of not great, but it's good to know sort of the magnitude of effect. F squared, again, F squared is not something that has a ton of intuitive meaning for us, but it's the formal measure of effect size for regression. So just dropping that in there will save some graduate student down the road a lot of time having to figure that out on their own. So uh, good things to put in there. And with F squared, you've got benchmarks for rough benchmarks for small, medium, large. Like are trying to run the power analysis project down the road, kind of giving them a basis for that. So these are nice things to have in terms of your presentation. A lot of it can be just tabled up and just provided in there, uh, kind of paying it forward for the next person um, down the road, okay?
questions? All right, cool. Um, there are, so in your, in uh, um, your lectures folder, you're gonna see a supplemental uh, lecture slides that walk through providing confidence bounds on effect size estimates. Um, if you go through and take a look at that, there are, at the front of that, there's a link to uh, basically a, screen, uh, a screencast video on YouTube that has me walking through how to go through and calculate confidence intervals around your R squareds, your partials, your semi-partials and things along those lines. It's not super, it's about an hour sort of walking through those slides. What I'll have you do for problem set five is walk through and just kind of walk through that tutorial so that you kind of know how to go through and do that. I'm not gonna, I cut it out of our main lecture just because it's a lot of just procedural, sort of this is how you do math types of stuff. But for problem set five, you'll wanna go through and review that and sort of have that put together uh, in order to run some confidence bounds for, for that problem set. Okay, cool. All right, so let's go through break there. Uh, come back at quarter till and we'll talk about some ANCOVA stuff.